Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mobile Security in a Remote World. My name is Ali Mellon. I'm a security strategist in the office of the CSO at Cyber Reason. A little bit about me, I've been in tech for 10 years. I'm a computer engineer by training. Um, five of those years were actually spent doing mobile app development. I ran my own consultancy building mobile apps for universities and different business organizations. So I'm very passionate about mobile, um, but actually over the past few years, I have been doing some IoT research that actually culminated in a talk at Black Hat USA. And that was my real introduction into cybersecurity. And from there, I started working at Cyber Reason, writing about security, and now I'm actually in the um, security team at Cyber Reason, working on product security and infrastructure security. So I have um, really gained an appreciation, not just for mobile and mobile app development, but also for enterprise security and the security side of things, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today. So thank you for being with us. I wanna start by talking about security today and then get into what mobile really is before diving into how to actually protect mobile. From there, I wanna look at a very specific example of mobile malware research that I find fascinating, and then really talk about how to have a stronger approach to mobile security that integrates other aspects of enterprise security. So let's get started. Before we can talk about security today, we really have to talk about security yesterday because so much has changed over the past year, given everything that's happening with coronavirus. It's really important that we talk about where we started. When we're thinking about the enterprise makeup before 2020, we're looking at a wide array of bring your own, company owned and custom devices. Now we see that there are more bring your own devices than company owned or custom. And in fact, only 26% of companies actually give their employees smartphones. However, 87% of organizations expect workers to use their personal phone for work. So there's a huge disparity here between expectations of the business with regards to mobile devices and actually what they're willing to pay for and give out. And this is important to consider when we think about why it's important to protect mobile devices and why this is such a big problem for the industry. Now, I wanna start with a question, which is, do you use your personal smartphone for work? I personally do, especially before the pandemic, I used it quite often, um, whether it was sending an email on my Uber ride into work, or using it to communicate over Slack when I didn't necessarily have access to my laptop, accessing Google Drive. All of these things are ways that I was using my personal device, which also has my own personal Twitter, my own personal Instagram, but it also has access to corporate data. And what's important to note is that 60% of devices containing or accessing enterprise data are mobile. And this is, again, before this shift to remote work. So this is really important to consider as we look at whether or not we're really doing our best to protect mobile devices, whether or not it's important to protect mobile devices. So you have the majority of um, devices accessing corporate data on mobile, but what's even more important than this is that enterprise users are three times more likely to fall for a phishing link on a small screen rather than a desktop. So you are taking something where a lot of corporate data is actually being accessed and it is much easier to fall for a phishing attack on that device. And we already know that one of the biggest struggles in security is actually preventing people from falling for phishing links. So this presents a huge challenge for enterprises. So now I wanna talk about security today. We've had to integrate work with our existing lifestyle. Many people have had to work from home globally now. And we're really stuck using our devices for things that they shouldn't necessarily be used for. 70% of companies plan to permanently shift to remote work post COVID. And we're really expected to integrate our work life into our existing lifestyle. 
And what I want to talk about with that is really what it means to secure this remote work scenario, because it's not just limited to traditional endpoints like laptops or workstations. We also have to take into account the fact that people now have to take their dogs for walks, take their children to the park, and they may need to do these things during the, the typical work day, the typical nine to five. In order to do that, I know a lot of people are more comfortable with having access to things like Zoom or Slack or Google Drive or email on their mobile device so that when they go out for these walks, they can actually take that device with them in case of emergency. So it's really critical to consider how the shift to remote work has actually made us more interested in using our mobile devices just so we can keep up to date, but not necessarily be tied to the laptop or workstation. This is also compounded by the fact that many people who are working from home now in large enterprises have kids and some have young kids. And as we know, this has been a particularly challenging time for people who have children who are young and who are not used to being stuck inside all day with their parents and not having the ability to see their friends at school um, and to get their energy out in a particular way. And so a lot of parents have been forced to turn to their mobile devices as a source of comfort for their kids, whether it's through various games that they can use on the mobile device or whether it's just through surfing YouTube. It's a great way to make sure that your kid has something to do and stays engaged and doesn't get bored, especially when you have to be on work calls all day. And so you have this device that most likely has access to corporate data that your children are now using, and they definitely don't know how to tell the difference between a phishing link and a legitimate link that's going to take them to their favorite game. So this is where we really need to consider how we can solve this problem and really more clearly define the lines between work and home, even though they're so blurred right now. So I want to talk about what mobile really is because it's important to level set here. Even though it may seem obvious, we need to consider things like, is a laptop mobile? Because you can move around with it. You can go places with it. What about IoT devices, which can be very mobile? Things like drones, things like um, automated cars, things like um, hospital equipment that connects to your phone, all of these things need to be considered. But for the context of this conversation, I wanna level set at mobile as a smartphone. But I want to put this thought in your minds that it really shouldn't matter what type of these devices we're talking about here. We need a unified approach to talk about all of them. So even though we're gonna be pretty strictly talking about what we consider smartphones and what we consider mobile devices being smartphones, it's important to note that this needs to be extensible because if it isn't, we're going to be trying to overcome a pretty insurmountable and unscalable issue. So let's look at the risk on these devices. First, of course, with mobile devices, there's always the on-device risks. These are things like accessing people's email or getting any data that's available on the device. The second, and I'd argue much in more interesting opportunity, is the actual way that you can use the mobile device as an entry point into the enterprise. Let's dig a little deeper. With device data and what's available immediately on the device, the risk comes from things like, of course, device storage. Anything that's stored locally on the device is fair game. Of course, as well, we see things like bypassing authentication factors, things like two-factor authentication, which we will see later in this presentation with the piece of mobile malware we're going to look into. And the impact can be very challenging. Another opportunity for an attacker is through business application functions. This is more specifically things like G Suite, things like Zoom, things like DocuSign, these applications that an attacker who has access to the device may be able to get access to that could have very sensitive corporate data. And the last is the surveillance aspect of a mobile device. We saw this in particular with Operation SoftCell last year from a bit of a different angle. 
In Operation Soft Cell, attackers used call detail records to track high value targets. Mobile really presents a new way of doing this kind of tracking because you have a surveillance device literally on you at all times. You have a microphone, a camera, a GPS, and an accelerate, accelerometer on you at all times. And we need to be considerate of the fact that that is a spy's dream, is having access to a device like this on you all the time. So a question for the audience is, do you actually have any of these on your phone right now? These are some popular applications that need to be considered. Things like Salesforce, which of course has a lot of customer data. Um, DocuSign, which can have very important legal work on it. Asana, which is a project management tool, which may not seem immediately like it would have a large impact, but it still needs to be considered because it can have a lot of information on your product roadmap, your marketing roadmap, um, your company roadmap more generally, and the nuances and intricacies of your process. Also, Zoom is a very important one. A lot of very important conversations happen over Zoom for a lot of enterprises and having access to something like this can be very impactful. And of course, G Suite, which we've mentioned a few times, but access to things like Google Drive, Google Docs can give attackers a lot of really valuable information about an organization as this type of collaboration software is used quite frequently to collaborate on different corporate um, corporate data. The second interesting avenue of attack that I want to talk about is that enterprise entry point. Say we are out of the pandemic, you're able to go to a coffee shop and go into work, you go to a coffee shop and you connect to a Wi-Fi network that you think is legitimate. It's called Starbucks Wi-Fi 2, for example. Needless to say, it's actually an attacker and they're able to use that to get access to your device. Then you go into work, your device is currently um, infected by malware, you go into work and you connect to the corporate network. And now the attacker has a path to all of these other devices on the network, whether they're protected or not, whether they're mobile devices or laptops or uh, workstations. And they are actually able to move laterally to these devices. And the very challenging part of this is that they're not only able to move to these devices, but unless you have a mobile security solution in place, you can't even tell that this is where the attack started. If you have something like an endpoint protection platform, of course, you can tell when it gets to these traditional endpoints, but you can't actually see where the attack started because you don't have any visibility onto that mobile device. And this, the data backs this up. 80% of malicious apps have access to internal networks and are scanning nearby ports. So this is even more critical because these mo pieces of mobile malware, they're looking to expand. They're not looking to just stay on the device itself. They wanna get as much information as they can off of the mobile device, and then they want to move to other options. And that has the potential to open this attack up even more. When we think about mobile security solutions, we're looking at things like mobile threat detection, which is all about collecting the right data, analyzing it, preventing what it can, and then detecting and remediating effectively, much like your existing EPP flat platforms, but for a mobile device. It does this all in real time. And I think that they're very valuable, but my concern as someone who does work on infrastructure security is do I really want the security team to have to deal with another point solution? Is this the answer that my team is looking for or are they gonna feel burdened by yet another solution and they have over 25 different solutions in the SOC that they have to manage? Are they really gonna want that next solution? The new solution that they just have to consider even more issues that are coming in, even more false positives, even more actual incidents, it's a very complex issue and we need to consider the time that our analysts have and the ability to really bounce from different, um, different contexts and context switch with this. But with existing solutions today, 
it's important to note that mobile device management and enterprise mobility management are things that people are considering as well. And a lot of you might have the question of, are these two competing? And I would argue that they are not just in competition, they're actually complementary, and they're very important to integrate together. And when you're looking at mobile threat detection solutions, you need to look at ones that integrate effectively with your existing MDM or EMM. This to me is much like the typical IT security divide. What we're talking about here with mobile device management and enterprise mobility management, that is really for the IT side of the house, the IT security side. This is critical to update policy and to do a lot of things that are necessary in order to prevent the preventable. But when you get to actually being able to detect, detect and stop attacks, that's where mobile threat detection really starts to shine. So if you can integrate those two together, it will just make things even stronger. Now let's look at an example of a piece of mobile malware. This is a mobile banking Trojan targeting the financial services industry. It specifically looks to gather user data and it targets the US and Europe. Now, what's really fascinating about this, this is actually an attack that was discovered by our Cyber Reason Nocturnus team. That's our, um, that's our research team within Cyber Reason. And this application was actually targeting over 200 different financial services applications on Android devices. What's most interesting about this is not only was it targeting 200 different applications, which is a massive number, but it was targeting really high profile ones. Things like Capital One UK, um, PayPal Business, Revolut, Santander UK, TransferWise, which I personally have on my phone. Coinbase, ING Direct, and even Unicredit. So you can see it's targeting a lot of applications and not just consumer applications, but also business applications like PayPal business. Applications that are specifically meant to both contain business um, financial information and also can potentially contain information about their customers. So what did this look like? This attack comes in several parts. We were lucky. Um, our team actually saw this attack so early on in the process that they were able to see the attacker iteratively improving the application in order to make the application appear as legitimate as possible. Ultimately, we know that they wanted to get this on the Google Play Store. The challenge was making it look legitimate enough to get there. We saw this attack so early that we did not actually see it on the Google Play Store, but we do know that that was what they were looking to do with it. So once they were able to get a user to download the application, since it does look legitimate, they immediately look to get control. And they do this by requesting, simply requesting user access to the accessibility features. Once they have access to the accessibility features, they really have a lot more access than I think a lot of people expect. They start running in the background and they collect some reconnaissance information like device info and the names of Android packages. This is how they know what applications are on the device. And then they can run that list against the applications that they're targeting. Now, from there, they actually start to collect information, very important information like device pin, financial information, personal data, keystrokes, and passwords. So for those of you in the audience, if any of you have ever copy pasted a password from the notes app, this piece of malware would now have that password and username. So this is really important because it does give the attacker access to the username and password data of the applications that are on your device. That's particularly critical as it's looking at financial services applications which of course can store a lot of really critical information and can give attackers access to financial data. It exfiltrates all of that data to its C2 server. And then this is where things get really interesting because you may be thinking, well, that's fine because with all of my financial um, services applications, I have two-factor authentication enabled. So I'll be able to stop the attacker even if they try to log in. However, 
keep in mind that this attacker actually has access to your mobile device. So when the attacker tries to log into these accounts, two-factor authentication does, it job, does its job. It sends a text message to your mobile device, but the attacker is able to steal that message, read any information it needs, send it back to the attacker, and then delete the message. So not only do you never know that two-factor authentication um, sent you a message, but the attacker is now able to get into the account without any delay. So this is a particularly scary attack because it allows an attacker to not only gain access to these accounts, but also to bypass security measures that you may have in effect to prevent someone from getting into these accounts. And what I think is important to mention here is that um, this is a mapping of the MITRE attack for mobile techniques. If you don't know what MITRE attack is, it's a knowledge base of adversary techniques, uh, tactics, and procedures that, and basically it's a, not only a framework, but a common language by which we can communicate about threats. We put one of these out with every single piece of research that we do. And this mapping is really valuable because it's um, able to really communicate what the attack looks like step by step. So this is an example of MITRE attack for mobile and the what the attack looks like following each of these different tactics and techniques. And I also want to highlight this example, which leverages fears of coronavirus in order to get people to download something supposedly from the Google Play Store, even though this is not a World Health Organization app. This is not going to take you to the Google Play Store. And it's, of course, a piece of malware. So as we talked about a little earlier, the question that I have is, is another point solution the answer? Because I'm hoping that this talk has helped you understand why it's important that we start to take mobile seriously and that we start to protect mobile devices. But is another point solution really something that we want? Do we want another console to monitor? Because I can tell you, I do not. As I mentioned earlier, I do not want to have the security team have my L1 have to deal with another console that, and have to manually connect the dots between these mobile attacks and whether or not they've actually reached any other devices. It's also worth noting that attacks don't stop at their first entry point. As we've seen here, the majority of mobile malware is looking to expand. It's looking to get to other devices. And if we show only the mobile device that's under attack, we could be missing the entire story of how this attack has already expanded to other traditional endpoints. So what we really need is something that can unify mobile threats and traditional endpoint threats that isn't a human being, that doesn't require manual correlation from the analyst side of things. Attackers aren't separating mobile attacks from traditional endpoints. We see that from the data and we shouldn't be separating it either as defenders. So what I am an advocate for is taking the approach of accepting the right data whether it's mobile, whether it's endpoint, whatever the case may be, analyzing it, preventing what you can, detecting what you can, and remediating it quickly across all types of devices. And I think that this is what we need to strive for, both as an industry and within our teams itself, is not making this more complicated for our team, but giving them an approach that incorporates all of these new types of devices, because we really need to be thinking about what the future looks like and what this is going to look like in five years or 10 years. Mobile can serve as a blueprint for how we as a security team accept new types of devices, whether it's an IoT device, whether it's Elon Musk's chip in the brain, we need to consider these so that we can actually provide a more comprehensive and complete solution. I think that's what's really gonna be important. It's especially important because we've seen the acceleration of digital transformation thanks to this pandemic, and we need to be able to address that and to really present solutions 
that incorporate all new types of incoming data and incorporate all new types of devices if we want to keep up with the business and actually enable the business instead of holding it back. I want to thank you guys so much for attending. I hope that you are enjoying the conference and I hope you enjoy the rest of it as well. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. There's my email and you can also find me on Twitter at HackerBella. Thank you again and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the day.